Good afternoon. My name is Donna Lucas, and on behalf of the board of the Public Policy Institute, welcome today. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make these events possible, and you can see many of them listed up here. Uh, underwriting events like this really, really help us to bring amazing, great speakers like our treasurer, John Chung. The series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle, which is a group of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Funding from our sponsors and donors make programs like today possible. Uh, I encourage you to learn more about how you can join the PPIC Donor Circle uh, by checking our website or by talking to any of our many talented staff members who are here today. So before we begin a couple of housekeeping items, uh, you will receive an email from PPIC later today, a survey, please. We take our surveys very seriously. Please fill it out. We want to hear how you thought the program went. And also, please turn, take a moment to turn off your cell phones. You don't want to have those going off at any point in time. So I am delighted to turn this over to, to Mark Baldessari. And I just one personal note about our treasurer here. I understand when you were controller, he oversaw all the unclaimed property in the state of California. And he would before he would speak to a group, he would know who had unclaimed property in the room. <laughs> So, Treasurer Chung, I'm just here to tell you that that $2 million is mine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're delighted to have you here, and I'm going to turn this over to Thank Mark. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, welcome to PPIC, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us for this uh, conversation this afternoon. And Donna, thank you for that, that very nice uh, welcome and introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, let me just mention a couple of things about Treasurer Chung's uh, impressive background. Um, he moved to California, I just learned, in 1987. So, um, uh, and the state has been in better shape ever since. <laughs> um, right there. Um, in 1997, he was appointed to the Board of Equalization. Um, how many people here know what the Board of Equalization is? Okay, so good. You, you, know, what, you know what it is. It sounds like it's something from science fiction, um, but it's actually a very important um, uh, part of our state government, um, taxes. Um, just think taxes when you think about the Board of Equalization. And um, the, tre uh, the, the treasurer was elected in 1998 to the Board of Equalization, re-elected in 2002, was chair of Board of Equalization, and then um, elected as controller in 2006. How am I doing so far? You're brilliant. OK. <laughs> and uh, and reelected as controller in 2010. And in, in 2014, was uh, elected as uh, treasurer, and which is the office he now holds. So uh, very impressive, um, extensive background in, um, in fiscal issues in California. Um, that's, that's reflected in, um, in that background. Um, and uh, we have reached out to various people who have uh, made, uh, uh, made it clear that they have an interest in running for governor. PPIC doesn't support candidates or causes or ballot measures or anything like that. Uh, but we're interested in surfacing issues. Um, and so uh, we, we uh, invited uh, Treasurer Chung to come um, after learning that uh, he, was, uh, he was interested in running for governor. So for for a, few, for a few hours here today at PPIC, we're going to take a break from the presidential election, <laughs> um, right? If you're really interested in presidential elections, you can go and look at some political cartoons that we have um, it, it, um, on past presidential elections uh, on display in our salon um, after during the reception. But for today, we're going to, in the spirit of our our, our series on California's future, we're going to look over the horizon. Maybe you'll have some questions uh, that, you, that you'd like to ask in the Q&A period about the more here and now. But, but the treasurer and I have uh, decided that we're going to look over the horizon and see what the vision is long term for California. So uh, that will be my focus here today. And um, uh, again, in the spirit of our California Futures series, um, at the one question we had agreed uh, to, to in advance, and then we'll go wherever the, wherever the questions uh, and answers take us here today, 
was uh, to start out with a question on uh, um, asking uh, you, Treasurer Chung, uh, from your perspective, what are the, um, what do you see as the three top issues that will make a difference for California's future? Well, I think the three top issues that would make the largest difference are, is number one, education. Uh, when you think about the b basic economic building blocks, it's, it's human capital, it's the skill sets, it's the talents. Uh, for, but for me, it's when you have a world-class education, I think it brings to people's lives the great hope, uh, gives people an opportunity. And when you get to difficult cycles, uh, one where they're more resilient. Uh, and so I think when people feel that they get a broad-based education, you build the relationships, that you can accomplish anything. Uh, it may be difficult, but life isn't easy. Uh, but at least it gives you a pathway. Uh, second, for me, uh, because I've held all three financial offices at the state level for California, is the what do we do in regards to economic security, <clears throat> excuse me, and economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there's always going to be opportunity, excuse me, inequality. Uh, but what, what do we do to make sure that people who are trying to make it on a daily basis or those who are prospering today get the best opportunity? So what, is, what does California need and where, uh, what should we look like in the future and how do we get there? And then third is the environment. So whether it's climate change, whether it's water structures, uh, that is our basic human existence, uh, we have to make sure that uh, we ha address the existential challenges that impact our livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, um, let's explore each of those issues a little bit. I, I uh, spoke at, uh, at UC Riverside um, at an event on uh, political participation in, um, on Wednesday. And there was a gentleman in the audience um, from the African American community in, um, in the Inland Empire um, who, uh, who I thought asked really the key question um, that's, that's on so many of our, our, our minds today, and that is um, what can we do to, um, to increase the prospects for job opportunities and, and economic mobility? So what specifically can we do well, to, a... to change the pattern that, that we've gotten into since the Great Recession of um, of stagnant poverty levels and increasing um, uh, income inequality in our state? Well, we know that we've had a change in uh, economic activity. Uh, so through technology, through globalization, uh, the, the jobs that used to be relatively decent paying for those who don't have a high school education are deteriorating very rapidly. And so if we want to maintain the same quality of life, if we want to prosper in the future, we have to make sure that we increase everybody's educational attainment. Mm. Uh, and you have to do that by making sure that all communities provide great opportunities, right? There's that Harvard study from years back that talk about if you put a low-income child in a community of greater opportunities, they, they close that gap, gap dramatically. And they perform nearly as well as those kids uh, who come from higher incomes, mm. right? Kids will thrive. They will succeed if given greater opportunities. And one of the things that I want to, we need to all do is we need to be better citizens. We need to be better neighborhoods, right? Because you put a high impact person in a child's life and you don't have to be wealthy, you transform their experience. You tra transform their opportunities. Uh, Stanford did a study down the street, the, your networks make a big difference because you bring in more information. Mm -hmm. And so once people know that they can make better choices, it changes them. So, what do we do to create better communities that are healthier, provide better education, that are safe? And then what do we do in our schools? Again, it requires everybody who's all in, right? We need great school site leadership. So whether it's the administration, the principals, whether it's teachers and making sure that teachers are well supported, well, well they're well educated, they're well led. And what do we do to bring in parental involvement? Uh, my parents were immigrants to this country, came separately. Uh, didn't have a lot of wealth, even though my dad was very well educated, had a PhD. But my mom wanted to make sure that all of the kids got a great education. And so we had, we had cultural conflicts, right? I would battle my mom. My dad would go, why are you arguing with your mom? She goes, she just wants to be play piano and study the whole time. Right? <laughs> One of the things that my mom did is like, she goes, you can have your friends come over and study, right? I will cook and we come on Saturday Night Live. They could stay over and watch and watch, right? The, uh, so our great insurance commissioner, Dave Jones, is a high school classmate of mine. He was a part of the group that would come over and study 
Dave and I remained very close friends, so he emceed my two inaugurals as controller. When he was introducing my then 75-year-old mom, he said, every time I see Mrs. Chung, I get beads of sweat pouring down my neck. <laughs> my mom made a pledge to the other parents. Mm. Their kids, while they were under her stead, were going to get good grades. Right? So while she was all over me, she was all over Dave and everybody else. Mm. Right? And that's, that's what we need. Right? We need people. The, you know, I don't want to get a political, but right? it, it takes a village. It takes a neighborhood. It takes a community. Yeah. And um, at PPIC, we've been very interested in um, the fact that the way our economy is going, uh, the way the demography of our state is going, uh, the way our, our, our public uh, university systems are going, we're going to have um, a shortfall uh, which, uh, of college-educated workers in this state. Uh, according to Hans Johnson, who is here today, yes, there he is, 1.1 million. And Lande, hello. Um, and so what specifically should we be doing to um, make sure that that, that that workforce skills gap that's expected by 2030, which is only 14 years uh, from now, uh, does not become a reality? What should the state be doing in terms of higher education? So actually, I think if, if we're just depending on higher education, we've lost the battle. Right? We need to start very early on with early childhood education. And so whether it's looking at what they do with France with the, in regards to making sure that everybody gets an education, uh, part, part of this is uh, you know, what do we do for grade school early on? Make sure they get the appropriate counseling, including financial counseling. Mm -hmm. You have to have make sure that there is both a career and educational track, because when you bring both of those together, the financial sust sustainability of that child and their academic uh, progress works very well. And then we have to have high expectations for everybody. I chair the state scholarship program. Once people start putting money into a program, that child's expectation of going to college mm. changes incredibly dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure that you have that through. And then we have to make sure that we have the proper tools in place to make sure that we monitor stu student achievement and student growth to make sure that they stay on the proper track to great success. And then as you pointed out, we have to make sure that as we push people, so it's not only graduating from high school, we need to make sure that they get at least an AA, some type of certificate, a bachelor's or more, uh, more and tie in the public sector as to identifying jobs so that if people need uh, some financial support, they're working, they have other types of alternatives so that they can continue in understanding it's a lifelong education. And as you look at the state's uh, budget, um, our, our, both our spending and where, uh, where, where we are with revenues, uh, and you think about the educational needs that you've identified both at the K-12 level and the higher education level, are we spending enough money? So we are financially challenged in California. We've made remarkable progress. So, uh, so, and if you just look at it from the credit ratings report, uh, Standard & Poor's uh, did two reports within the last three weeks. First, an analysis of California. They did one uh, about a state-by-state -state comparison. And so for those of you who haven't tracked our progress, uh, prior to the recession, California was the world's eighth largest economy with a state domestic product of about uh, $2 trillion. During the recession, we lost 1.34 million jobs, right? And so we lost a million taxpayers in California with a tr dramatic decrease in tax revenues. Uh, we had about $1.9 trillion economy. And I apologize to all of you because I start to recognize and <laughs> throw out a lot of numbers. Uh, and then today, we're the world's sixth largest economy with slightly less than a $2.5 trillion economy. However, our state tax revenues, we have to understand that even though we're the sixth most prosperous state, we still have dramatic disparity in wealth concentration. Those who are doing very, very well, performing very highly, and those, especially those who uh, that low income, don't have that educational attainment in this new world. That's why I was harping on making sure that we provide greater education. So uh, we're going to have to figure out, prioritize like an investment banker. And that's why I said invest first in education. Uh, make sure that we do it at the lowest cost possible. Make sure that you protect the economic security good health care, good public safety, and then build the infrastructure. Because you can't operate the world's most prominent economy mm -hmm. on, on third world infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? Our classrooms are 
falling way behind. Our beautiful University of California, right? They don't have enough investments in the technologies and the capital infrastructure so that they can comfort, support their scientists and the students are making life-changing discoveries. Well, let's, let's talk a moment about infrastructure, uh, which, you, which you just uh, brought up. Uh, the governor has um, had the legislature in a special session for uh, roads and infrastructure since, what, last summer? Last summer it started? They, they've had that discussion for, for about a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, I think it's safe to say that we're not there yet, right? We, haven't, we really haven't uh, found our way to, um, uh, to a funding source for what, what everybody um, in California agrees is a need, that we need to invest more in roads, we need to invest more in infrastructure. Um, whether you live in the Inland Empire, and I was driving around there the last couple of days, and you know that's difficult. And then, of course, the Bay Area is no, um, no better. Um, uh, and you mentioned also we've got buildings, um, we've got capital expenses. Um, and, um, but the legislature and the governor have not been able to come to some agreement on um, what the funding source is and how we're going to find our way there. Um, Bonds seem to be out of favor now because we don't want to get into more debt. Um, um, so what would, what would you suggest to break through the logjam um, that we currently have with the governor and legislature on roads and infrastructure if we're going to get to the point that you say we should and could get to? Yeah, so it's going to be a combination. Uh, the, in, in the political reality of taxation uh, and the, going aside from infrastructure but basic taxes, the three major sources of general fund revenues for the state of California are personal income taxes. And by far, uh, and if you want to get a sense of who pays it, in 2014, the top 1% paid 48% of the personal income taxes. Uh, and, and that fluctuates depending on how well the economy is performing. Sales and use tax makes up less than 30%. But to think back 40 to 45 years, sales tax was the number one general fund revenue source of the state of California. And then number three is corporate taxes. So that comes in anywhere from 7 to 9% of state tax revenues. So when people are talking about we want to shift the reliance from the top 1%, mm -hmm. the, the challenge is right, you would naturally move to sales tax. Well, if you look at taxation history in the United States of America, they created the sales tax and they created the income taxes during the Great Depression, right? Because historically, California and the rest of America depended on property taxes. But with property tax declines during the Great uh, Depression, they had to find other sources of, of revenue. People don't like new taxes, right? That's why you, you go back to the old, true and tested tax, the income tax, and they lift that tax. It's also a question of who has the strongest financial wherewithal Mm -hmm. to bear those types of taxes. So going back to the infrastructure, right, we used to have the vehicle license fee, right, you would try to create some type of standard, right, they're talking about increasing that sum so you have gasoline some base tax. amount. The gasoline tax, uh, right, has not been inflation adjusted, mm -hmm. but the challenge is we continue to get decreases because there's uh, the miles traveled and the fact that you have newer vehicles, even though you don't have huge penetration by electrical vehicles, but over a period of time you will. So is that a long-term sustainable source that you want to depend on if that's going to continue to deter, uh, decrease as a percentage of usage? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then others are talking about it hasn't moved politically, uh, some type of carbon tax. So you will get some type of blend as to how you finance infrastructure, especially road maintenance and uh, new, uh, new construction of roadways. So through some type of balance of those uh, taxes. And why has it been so hard for this governor, who obviously has a lot of experience being governor in this legislature, which obviously has a lot of political um, uh, interest in um, doing something that its constituents want, uh, to find their way to uh, a solution, even in New Jersey. I shouldn't say even in New Jersey, but in New Jersey. How about this? In New Jersey. I used to live in New Jersey. Um, they, they, uh, they found a way to, uh, to increase uh, taxes uh, so, uh, for roads, which everybody thought was needed. Um, and uh, 
with all that we've been able to do in California, this doesn't seem to be an area that, um, that we've made any progress yet. What's, what do you think the problem is? Yeah, I, I think we will. Part of it, it requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, and there's discussions in Sacramento about uh, taking some of those monies from cap and trade and to use it for transportation infrastructure. I think as all, we all well know that uh, the cap and trade fee uh, is uh, in litigation. And so we don't know to what extent it will survive. Uh, yeah at least for some of the spending purposes that it's used for today, right? So if they clean it up, right. use areas where it's not as controversial. Right. Um, but that is part of the holdup in the discussion as to providing and identifying a solution for infrastructure spending. Yeah. And how much cap and trade will actually generate has been a question mark, which maybe now it'll be less so with the SB 32 passing and knowing that this program is going to go on for um, at least another um, uh, 14 years. Um, so when you think about these long-term um, uh, investments that the state needs to make in infrastructure, and you think about the two that the governor has put on the table um, during his time in office, the Delta Tunnels and the high-speed rail, um, how, do we, how do you balance all of those needs? And can all of those things be done? Should they be done? How, what are your thoughts about those other two big long-term projects that the governor has, uh, has said are needed for California's future? So here's the mix. So we, are, uh, we have $86 billion in uh, outstanding debt uh, for the state of California. We have about uh, close to $37 billion in authorized but unissued uh, debt for the state of California. Our debt affordability ratio is, a, is about, uh, or not debt affordability ratio, but our debt ratio is about 6%. Mm. And so the question is, right, there is no set standard. The question is, uh, how much do we want to lock up the future budgets? Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the ratings agencies uh, in regards to states' wherewithals, uh, especially during a downturn in the economy, California's structure, uh, the, the limitations that the voters and others impose, makes California less flexible to respond during a downturn in the economy. Mm -hmm. So we want to be sensitive to all of that stuff. That's why I like to try to build more public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. So we need more mass for transportation. We need more alternative transportation. But we have to look at what, what happens if you look at a budget that's 90% already identified, mm -hmm. and so you have less than 9% that's flexible, and that 9% goes to nearly nothing during a downturn in the economy. Like how much more can we carry in nor normal and routine operating expenses? And I would argue it's very little. Okay. So when you're looking at you know high-speed rail, you know what can we do to partner to make sure we get more outside investment to build uh, that project, for instance? Do you think we should do the high-speed rail? Uh, I like high-speed rail, but I want it privately financed. Okay. And what about the tunnels? The, uh, I think you want to explore. Delta tunnels. Well, right, there is a uh, practice in place mm -hmm. because you want to make sure that, first of all, you preserve the natural health mm -hmm. of the delta. Uh, right, you have the, the uh, it's very ecosystem uh, uh, in great strain, but you have to also understand that, you know, when they, people have turned this into a north south battle, the south starts at the Silicon Valley. And you're thinking about this very region. The Silicon Valley is the number one highest performing economic region in the United States of America, San Francisco's number two, Oakland's number 39, San Luis Bowl's number 10. Uh, we have to make sure that we protect that system, but make sure that you have proper water availability. And then you have, you have at all these great academic institutions, regional water solutions that are underway that are being developed. So hopefully that we can invest in it, we can create a greater springboard, so we are less reliant on the, on the delta. Mm -hmm. So less reliant on the delta over time. But, the, but it's still it's going to be heavy reliance, but you know, yeah. better water usage, better stormwater capture, other, op, other types of opportunity. In Carlsbad, you had desalination, but you don't want too much no. desalination. Yeah. Uh, we have a water center at PPIC. I think my colleagues are here from there, too. So we're, we're very interested in, in what your views are on this topic as well. You mentioned the environment as um, went early on when we said about the, the most important issues. So I want to come back to that for a moment. Um, and um, the, the state is, uh, is on a path with climate change and energy policy. And I'd like, uh, and um, 10 years ago, Governor Schwarzenegger and uh, a Democratic legislature passed AB 32, setting in place cap and trade, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and so forth. 
Um, and in a sense, um, this last summer, the, um, the legislature and the governor um, doubled down on this, on this policy and said, you know, we're, go we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions even more, um, and we're going to extend it out to 2030, so the next 14 years. Um, and I think it's safe to say that we don't know exactly how we're going to get to those, um, those goals that we've now set. They're much more ambitious goals than the ones that were set 10 years ago, which we clearly you know, have, have met um, and will meet by 2020. Um, so are we on the right path? Do we need to do more? How do we get there? Yeah, so you, the, the, legislative, the legislation that passed SB 32 obviously creates a lot of incentives and activities. Uh, right? There are always technical challenges, but right, people wouldn't have imagined that we would have got, with AB 32, get back to the 1990 standards by 2020. It's going to be always more challenging, but it will require more behavioral adjustments in the private sector, both in the business community and, the, uh, and with consumers uh, themselves. And then you, you strike up a lot of interesting relationships. So the moment the governor talks about that, you know, I'll have meetings with Mary Nichols, I'll have meetings with my office, I'll have meetings with Brian Kelly, meet with Anna Eshu about what the various government agencies working together ought to look like. They'll come to my office because as the, uh, as the state's treasurer, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm the state's banker. Mm -hmm. So right, whether it's commercial banking, investment banking, how do you finance these types of activities? So for instance, I am pushing, I am leading the national effort to do municipal green bonds. Hmm. But you just don't want to put out green bonds that make no sense. Right? The, and you, it's the wealthy people who invest in municipal bonds, mm -hmm. but you can look over the next few decades, a transfer of between 30 and $40 trillion from the baby boom generation and the older generation to a millennial generation that by twice the amount believes in invest, environmental investing. And so that's why we're trying to push out these types of investments so that you can spur the research, you can spur the financial activities that hopefully generate the requirements of uh, SB 32. And um, as the legislature has debated the, the issues around um, climate change legislation and energy policy, um, there's been, uh, I think it's safe to say, tension around whether these are policies that really take into consideration disadvantaged communities, uh, both from the standpoint of where, um, where the pollution is taking place as well as where, where some of the opportunities, uh, tax credits and otherwise, around, um, around uh, a green energy policy are taking place. And I'd like to get your thoughts about um, um, how, how to balance those, those issues of um, improving the environment and making sure that disadvantaged communities in, in California uh, are taken care of in the process uh, or, and are better off, not worse off in the process. Yeah, so there's, there's huge debate. Assemblymember Jimmy Gomez out of downtown Los Angeles uh, wants a redirection of a lot of those monies into uh, low-income communities. Uh, there, there are tremendous opportunities. We have 80,000 brownfields in the state of California. My top priority last year uh, as state treasurer was to try to build more affordable housing. And so a lot of those brownfields are in disadvantaged communities, right? And the, the contamination about it has brought about economic decline because no, there's not as much investment. In meeting with the Senate President Pro Tem and meeting with the governor's office, I advocated, for instance, investment in looking at those brownfields so that we can clean them up, so that you use those dollars to build affordable housing or to build centers where you have create new types of enterprise so that you can, so in fact, you can do both, mm. right? There are opportunities in those communities. It would help with energy, it would help with transportation, it would help with housing, it would help rebuild the middle class. Mm -hmm. What can the state government do um, in the realm of affordable housing? I mean, it's such, it's such a problem in our metropolitan areas now and the Bay Area um, and, you know, we run the risk of, uh, you talked about uh, the millennial um, generation, we, we run the, list, ri the risk of, uh, of really making it very difficult for, the, for, for people who we, uh, we create the talent through our higher education system to actually want to stay here and live here because they can't afford the housing. Um, 
How much can we expect out of the state government and what can be done? So it is a huge problem. So when I toured the drug manufacturer across the Bay BI to when I participated in the uh, Gay Pride Month celebration at Facebook and talking with some of their executives, I said, what are your big issues? And they said, John, you need to fix housing. Yeah. Right, you need to fix housing. Uh, the, you know, the Facebook representative saying, hey, we can't even recruit Ivy League educated individuals because we'll give them and offer them this high salary, but when you start talking about paying $3,000 or more for monthly rent, right, it automatically turns, turns them off. So I sit on three of the states for, for housing authority. I chair what's called the tax credit allocation committee, which is the 9% uh, tax credit, and there's also a 4% credit. So in my inaugural speech last year, I said I'm gonna work on rewriting the affordable housing regulations mm. for the state of California. And so in Bill Lockyer's last year, my predecessor who did a nice job, we, and obviously these are very small numbers, but you have to start somewhere. We, we help finance the construction of about 5,800 affordable housing units uh, on an annual basis. I rewrote the regulations with a great colleague, Controller Betty Yee, and the Department of Finance's representative. What we said is we're gonna let developers make more money, but we wanna do deeper affordability, right? If you look at San Francisco, if you look at Los Angeles, and it's becoming more widespread, we have more homeless people, right? Whether it's those with mental health issues, whether it's single moms, right? Single moms trying to carry their kids, right? The, the incredible mental health issues, the cognitive deterioration, and the impact on kids because they're not going to the same school day after day after day, right? Really impacts their educational attainment. And so we wrote the affordable housing regulations. And so last year and this year, just to give you an example, so instead of the 5,800 units that we did in 2014, thus far this year, we've approved close to 14,000 units. Hmm. So we'll, we'll continue to ramp it up. We know we have a long way to go. On an annual basis, we need 60,000. But we're headed in the right way. We had a $3 billion backlog of federal tax credits that could be used. Uh, my staff worked really hard. We pushed out $2 billion. Hmm. Tons here. And part of it is we need local governments and partnerships. right? If you don't plan for what your city is gonna look like 10 years ago, you're gonna have housing challenges. And then when you know you're gonna have economic prosperity as you do in this area, and you're not gonna protect middle income and low income workers, you're asking for the unfolding crisis that we have today. Is some of this because we, uh, we did away with redevelopment agencies? Yeah, it, it impacts it. So I don't know how many people are, are familiar with affordable housing finance. So there is a federal, state, and local government component and so they used to set it aside for right, area, area mean. So they used to target about 60%. So between federal, state, and local, you do 40%, and then the, the renter would have to do 60%. Well, if you're homeless, you don't come anywhere to 60%. If you're special needs, you don't come anywhere for 60%. So part of my redesign was I told developers, I'll let you make more money, mm. but I want you to do deeper affordability. Right? Can you get to 50? Can you get to 40? Can you get to 30? so that we can get, put people in housing. Uh, and so what happened is in our financial crisis, uh, we owed education a lot of money. Right? We had over $10 billion in deferrals. Uh, that, and part of that is what I did, right? because I used to be the controller. You used to pay your taxes to me. And I, if you got a tax refund check, it would come under my signature. Um, the state didn't have enough money, so I didn't give you your tax refunds in February of, 20, February of 20, 2009 for 23 days because I didn't want the state to, de to default. And so part of that in trying to provide the solutions is we didn't pay all, we had to defer some payments. Mm -hmm. So the governor wanted to make sure that we had more money available for education, so we eliminated the redevelopment agencies. The redevelopment agencies as local governments, one of local governments' major economic growth tools. And local governments, when they had redevelopment agencies, were required to take 20% of that money for low and middle mod income housing. So when the redevelopment agencies were eliminated, local governments, 20% that they would use for building affordable housing was no longer there. Mm -hmm. And that's in part part of the crisis we have today because local governments say we don't have an economic development tool and we don't have money to build affordable housing, or at least our contribution. So should, we, should that come back? We should do it in more limited aspects. Uh, when the governor talked about it, uh, as the state controller, I did a review. Mm -hmm. um, 
and not a general term review. Uh, when you don't do all the standards, it's a, uh, the yellow book, it's an audit. When you do some things less, it's called a review. So I did a review of 18 redevelopment agencies throughout the state of California. So some of that money was abused. Some of the money in the desert in Southern California was used for a four and a half star golf course, right? That sh you shouldn't use precious taxpayer dollars. That's not gonna help with housing. The, yeah. yeah, or you should, yeah. and the whole, whole city of Coronado was a redevelopment agency, yeah. right? Yeah. And Coronado is just absolutely beautiful, yeah. right? So, um, yeah. so if we bring it up in limited scope, Mm -hmm. the, that would so be you the think six, 60,000 houses a year, I heard you say. Or that deep affordability. Or that deep affordability. You think we can get there? Uh, over a period of time, uh, but we're, we're a million and a half units short. So I was just talking about deep yeah. affordability, right? We need more because you need, you need affordable housing, you need workforce housing, and you need market rate. Yeah. So if I look over the horizon um, at, at our budget, uh, situation in California and also the needs of our of our residents, something that we've learned in the last five years as the Affordable Care Act has been implemented. Um, I've been surprised at, at the numbers in the Medi-Cal, um, uh, both the size of that uh, Medi-Cal um, population now, which is the largest health plan in the state, right? Um, I think it's about a third of Californians. Mm -hmm. Um, and what the projections are for the costs of Medi-Cal and, of course, uh, providing really good medical care and, and, and health care for, uh, for, for, uh, for the participants in the Medi-Cal program. What's your vision for how this is going to get done over time? Yeah, so here's our challenge. We're a state of uh, about 39 and a half million people, and if you use the the numbers that the governor used in his May revise uh, speech, he's mentioned 14.1 million Californians qualify for Medi-Cal. Other people will use 13 and a half mm -hmm. million numbers, right? So how, how th that difference, we won't explain, or explain here. But when you're thinking in a time where California's economy is quote unquote by the ratings agency unmatched, we still, as you pointed out, have one third of our state that qualifies for Medi-Cal, yeah. right? That's a recipe for disaster during the next recessionary downturn. And part of it, we're all getting older, you still have the financial, the huge financial challenges. So we're gonna have to put in place better practices, right? And we have to ha start having the negotiations. Uh, John from Kaiser over here, uh, <laughs> wanna recognize Kaiser. Uh, I sit on CalPERS, which is the nation's largest public defined benefit plan. Uh, what people oftentimes don't know is that CalPERS is also e the nation's second or third largest healthcare purchaser in the United States. So it ought not just to be about treating sick people, it should be about how do you keep people healthy mm -hmm. so that you don't have the greater costs on all of us. And then once you're treating people, how do you not have people get sick once again, right? So the continuum of care needs to be much better. Kaiser, along with others, I had a great staff person, Ruth holton Hodson, my healthcare deputy, come up with the idea of healthier you, right? So this is with the state workforce, our unfunded, our, our OPEB, which is healthcare liabilities for the state is $74 billion. You know, so if you just do a 1% increase, uh, decrease in, you know, one of the five major issues of healthcare, whether, you know, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's coronary issues, whether it's hypertension, we save the taxpayers of California $18 million. So Kaiser was willing to help fund our study where we try to look at workplace rules. We partner with unions because the state workers don't necessarily trust management. They don't necessarily trust their healthcare provider. They oftentimes, more oftentimes, trust their union. So how do we get the union to be good partners as to we get better workforce health efforts, right? Do we need to change the workforce rules? When I was in the controller's office, I was on the 18th floor on 300 Capitol Mall. The stairs were locked, right? 18, I'd like to walk the 22 steps through each floor to get my, what was originally a 12 minute workout into a seven minute workout when I got into better condition, <laughs> right. right? But just, just those steps, yeah. those better behaviors, change healthcare incomes and have a huge impact on healthcare costs. Terrific. Um, you mentioned um, in passing uh, OPEB and um, I, I, this would be a good time for us to, you sit on the CalSTRS board, you sit on the CalPERS board, good time to talk about um, the pensions in California and also the, um, the, the healthcare costs for, for public employees. 
how worried are you about uh, the future of the pension system in California, both for state and local governments? So I am concerned. We all ought to be concerned about- On a scale of one to 10, maybe. The, What's your uh, level of concern? <laughs> well, where, the, where do you put uh, it? I, my numbers are always higher than the general public. That's right? okay. Because I, right, I was the controller during when California was in a deep financial mess. Yeah. Uh, when I had to issue the 450,000 IOUs for 2.6 billion dollars to make sure that we didn't fall, follow the same straight that Puerto Rico is today. And just to show, when you get good behavior, right? Big, uh, Puerto Rico's debt last year was trading at 13 uh, percent, right? So you're looking back to Jimmy Carter, uh, right? Mm -hmm. interest rate times. Uh, California, during our recession times, uh, compared to AAA rated states, for every billion dollars that we borrowed, we were paying $201 million more than federal credit rated states. Mm. But because we've, and you, the voters passed, and because our governor and legislature have done a much better job that $201 million more that we used to pay relative to other states is now $17.2 million. Now, this is how I think, right? During that recession, we put the onus on a whole bunch of people, right? We raised tuition on UC students by over 113%, raised it over 113% on Cal State students, raised it by 130% on community college students, right? That affordability, that issues with college students. And then I also think in $24,000 increments, right? If we add $24,000 to the UC system, we can stick another student mm -hmm. in there. That's why I care about mm -hmm. those, those types of interest costs. But so pensions, healthcare on OPEB. In my first year in office, I did the study two years earlier than one required under the government accounting rules. OPEB is healthcare liabilities and other healthcare related things for state employees. That obligation was $32 billion. And this is what happens, right, when you don't understand compound interest and when you, don't, when you pay minimum on the credit card. Because that $32 billion obligation was not paid in full on an annual basis, when you account for interest, that turned into a $47, $88 billion obligation. So it went 47.88, right, 52, 59, 62, 64. When I left office, right, it was close to a $70 billion obligation, and it's jumped to a $74, obligation, $74 billion obligation in Betty Yee's first two years as controller. That's why right, you need to get ahead of it, start paying down on an annual basis so you don't have that massive increase in interest costs that has huge opportunity costs for education, healthcare, all these other programs that we're talking about. Um, is it possible to get a handle on this, or is it too late? No, you have to do something else. It goes wildly out of control. And just so you have a sense, during the recessionary years, that in inflation didn't increase. Uh, as And Tom Epstein is also here from the healthcare field. There's greater utilization, mm. so right, it really spikes up the cost. During the recessions, there's less usage, so the healthcare inflation was uh, pretty narrow. So those years, I think the increases were about a billion. Yeah. Right? Some years, those increases are four to eight billion. So um, I've been uh, listening to you and trying to, 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 um, try to, trying to get a sense of what your, um, your fiscal philosophy is, your philosophy, philosophy about tax and spending. Um, and also watched, um, and at times really admired things that you've done in, in, in your in, in office, most recently, what you had to say about Wells Fargo, um, or uh, you know, telling the legislature they couldn't get paid, issuing IOUs. I mean, you know, conflict of interest things. There have been various things that you've done that have been tough. You know, um, when I when you know, if I'm asked to provide a philosophy around Jerry Brown, in terms of especially as working with the Democratic legislature, it would be fiscal restraint, right? So if you had to come up with a couple of words to describe what your fiscal philosophy is, what would it be? Smart financial investment. Smart financial investment. Right, because I believe in spending money. Uh, so, as I so I mentioned immigrant parents. Mm -hmm. uh, dad worked hard. Uh, mom took care of us. Uh, and you can do that in America back then. Uh, Realize you think about what they needed for the future for themselves and their kids, mm -hmm. right? So they prioritize. You need a roof over your head, 
You need your kids to get a good education. Right? You need to take care of your health care. So I would do the core issues that impact the most Californians mm. to make sure that everybody is secure today, right? And security today looks very different, right? Because for the middle class and low income, we need to figure out what we need to do in state government to make sure that they get child care. Mm -hmm. uh, because people can't work when they, they're worried about their, what happens to their kids on a daily basis. So mine would be, if you have the money, you invested in education, you invested in uh, safety, you invested in infrastructure, uh, make sure that you do the core issues correctly. And then when you have the other opportunity, housing, you work on the other types of issues. You do it as at low cost as possible, uh, and you do it as you know, a design uh, for what it ought to look like for the next 5, 10, 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Smart financial investment. OK. And uh, last but not least, um, you have a good job now. In fact, you have a great job, a really interesting job, and uh, where you can do a lot of good as treasurer. And um, you could run for that office again in two years uh, because you can, you know, and you've been controller, treasurer. You know, so um, I'm, everybody will have their own reasons for why they would want you to be governor or not, but um, why do you want to be governor? Yeah, the, so. You got a good job. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I, I want a job that makes uh, the dreams of more Californians e even greater. And uh, I, I feel incredibly blessed to be able to sit on this stage with you. I feel incredibly blessed that every day I get to w wake up, I get paid to try to make other people's lives better. Mm -hmm. right? when, when I grew up, we, our family was discriminated against, and I felt isolated, I felt excluded. But what's great about this country is that you get to change how we interact with each other. You get to change the way we govern. And so that's what I love about this. And just as I pointed out, just a middle class family, a good education, a safe neighborhood, and I get to, I get to be here trying to uh, help people. Um, and it's just really, it's really meaningful for, for me. So I just want to pass on to my six godchildren and my niece a world that's better than what was given to me. And I feel I couldn't be more blessed mm. uh, to have what I have. So, you know, what do I do in regards to providing my six godchildren in California the education they need, um, right? And, and the, the people uh, that you get to meet here is really, really exciting. So think of, instead of what we're witnessing today in America, and we talked about it a little bit yeah. in your office, right? For, for me, it's incredibly disheartening. It's sad to watch that Americans don't believe in each other. They turn on each other. Uh, when we were discriminated, I'd work really hard uh, through public and private service uh, uh, to make sure that that, that uh, antipathy that exists between people would hopefully evaporate. And so I want all Americans to, as I pointed out earlier, I want us to be Americans as we felt on September 11th. Mm -hmm. You know, we cared for each other, we fought for each other, we wanted the best for each other, and we knew we were Americans. Thank you. Well, I'm incredibly blessed and privileged to be on this stage with you today and have this uh, great audience uh, who I'm sure have a lot of questions. So, uh, John, I could go on and on, but I want to give everybody a chance to um, See if they have any anything they want that's on their minds that they'd like to hear from you. And really I want to appreciate. And it. I want to thank you, and I want to thank PPIC, and I want to thank Donna and Steve and and Marsha. It's, it's the research that takes place here, the the goodwill, the seriousness, the responsibility are the qualities that we need in our civic discussion, right. uh, in our civic engagement. So, and right, you bring people together to make sure that we try to create a better future. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Some questions. Yes. And if you please tell me who you are. Yeah, that'd be nice. And then if I could actually, I'm, I know, I'm, I'm creating onus. What your, <laughs> what your dream is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Terrell Gamble. I work for a firm called Blaylock Bill Van. Um, my dream is to retire tomorrow. <laughs> but I don't okay. think that's going to happen. Um, and I want to I thank you for so your, your statement on Wells Fargo. Um, my question is, sort of as California is today, mm -hmm. um, majority minority state, right? Uh, and the income gap and the wealth gap is sort of widening for people in communities of color, 
for women. Um, how do we sort of help from the state level, right, uh, minorities and women who uh, want to generate wealth, either through business uh, or through um, sort of whatever, right? You know, how do, how do we decrease that, that, that gap for women and minorities, business opportunities, um, and everything else, educational opportunities, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, so first of all, you make sure that they get a great education, right? So obviously early on, but any stage of life, right, whether it's uh, adult education, you look at their economic circumstances and what's required. That's why I raised earlier making sure that they have access to child care services, uh, which, is, which is a major impediment. And then we bring in a whole host of support programs. So when I was uh, at the Board of Equalization, my first job after law school was at the Internal Revenue Service, but I actually did pension plans. Uh, but I understood uh, the sensitivities and how difficult and how scary taxes could be. So when I was at the Board of Equalization, I, was, I created free tax education seminars, especially for businesses. Uh, the tax professionals that would, and it would be Steve's partner uh, coming before our board, right, they would charge anywhere from $600 to $1,000 an hour. Right? We know that low-income individuals can't afford that access to expertise. So we used to do, I had in my district, if you're a new business and you needed a tutorial, come meet with a Board of Equalization employee. We will tell you about what your tax implications are. Then I did small business seminars, bringing in experts as to you know, how to handle your business transactions. But then I also tried to do it because I mentioned community. I also started nonprofit seminars and religious seminars uh, to make sure religious organizations and others uh, got the tax expertise uh, that they needed. Right? So you have all those systems in place. One of the things uh, that I do today as the state treasurer, I chair 15 economic development authorities. I finance anything from taco trucks to Tesla across the bay. Mm. Uh, right? I advocated last year, and the governor was supportive. I wanted a continuation of our sales tax exclusion program because I wanted to continue to try to create more automobile and aerospace companies in the state of California. I wanted to keep that expertise here instead of those, have those industries deteriorate and leave elsewhere. But it can be difficult for individuals to get a sense of the programs that we have just in the treasurer's office. So come December, I hope that you'll pop on or tell others to pop onto my website. I've tried to create a, a web platform which is like match.com or amazon.com. So you come in and tell me, you know, I am, I'm Donna Lucas, right? I have this thriving advertising, public relations, corporate relations, public affairs business, right? I employ this many people. I'm in Sacramento, California, or I'm throughout the state of California. You know, what type of economic programs do you have out of the treasurer's office? Uh, basically, the design is, it's a proof and concept. I'd like to create a one-stop shop with all of government to make it easier for businesses to do business in the state of California. Right? And we're partners, partnering with the governor's uh, GoBiz unit. We're partnering with the Franchise Tax Board because the, I want them to share what tax credits deduction programs are available. Uh, we're partnering with the city of Riverside and Rancho Cucamonga because local governments, you look down the street in Fremont, they have a very vibrant economic development team. Uh, so eventually, I'd like to get one place because I want California to compete uh, with everybody to make sure that they know that this is a place that's serious about doing business and we're going to make it easier for you. So, yeah, some areas we lag, right, but never, never challenge the discovery and innovation of what's in Californians, right? You live in the heart of it and we'll, we'll get government to catch up. Question uh, here. Thank you. And she was the first person to raise her hand to, uh, when yeah. asked the question of who knows about the BOE. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Very good. It, it's, it's an honor to be here with you and to have you here in San Francisco with us this afternoon. My question is, I'm a proud small business owner, a proud graduate of San Francisco State and Cal, but the debt, um, mm. the, the, you know, trying to compete uh, here in San Francisco and in California when you have all this student loan debt, yeah. as well as, you know, um, David and I are research partners in working on smart cities. And we, as we travel around the, uh, around the world, our competition has free education and free, you know, access to grants for starting a small business. And then they come here, their governments send them here to the Valley. And we're trying to compete 
um, in an environment where we've got student loan debt and then trying to get find funding for our business and our research. So is there something that's being done for Californians to help us? Um, we've been spending a lot of time in Canada and Canada has so many great programs for advancing education as well as, as um, being able to have sm uh, small business grants. Are we going to be seeing some of that help for us Californians? Excellent question. So we're growing, as I just mentioned, the uh, tax, sales tax exclusion. We're trying to bring up new programs uh, for spur greater economic development. But part of this is we don't want to put too much in place uh, right away, right? Because one of the lessons learned from Gray Davis's days, and Gray at the beginning was trying to hold firm on the legislature, he's getting both pressure on the left and the right for permanent spending. And we, we all understand from our basic economics lessons, you don't eliminate the business cycle, you don't eliminate the monetary cycle, you don't eliminate the debt cycle, you don't eliminate the com commodity cycle. So what are the core things that we should be investing uh, on an annual basis? And then what are the one-offs that bring in the maximum return? And then how do we do that most efficiently? And then part of that is getting our budget to a solid place where we don't increase UC fees by 100%, right? How do we think future? And so that all of you know, actually when I was controller, it was unpopular in Sacramento. I, start, I posted the state's cash disbursements and revenues on a monthly basis. Why did I did that, do that even though it was unpopular? Because all of us should know how healthy our state is. And I did it for local government in regards to their numbers, not the the revenues and disbursements, right? So anybody could see if we were in a healthy position or we were falling into a weak position. Um, so hopefully you get to a place where we can start to address the educational issues to make sure that we start to take that down and we don't create as much of a burden. You see targets, uh, the way they design their finance, financial package, uh, so that somebody who has a debt after graduating from the UC system, on average has a $19,000 debt. Mm. But we know, right, the challenge is are the expenses outside because you know we're we're in the metropolitan areas that are absolutely exorbitant, but and so that's that that's part of the great challenge and part of the thing is right you want more affordable housing but you don't want to take existing housing down because if you look at pre recession median house in the state of California was six hundred thousand and then it dropped by 60%, according to the California Association of Realtors. And if 70% of Americans' number one asset is their house, right, that's why people felt scared. Right? That's why they were insecure. My number one asset just dropped by 60%. Uh, I'm told that we have one more question. So, and I better take the question from the middle. Well, actually, this person had, yeah, no, I'm sorry, this one okay. right here, sorry. Hi, I'm Brady Hirsch and I'm a Coro Fellow. Uh, I think my dream is to figure out what I want to do. <laughs> um, and I understand that a lot of state services are really dependent upon the returns from financial markets, such as pension funds. And as we know, those returns can often be highly volatile and dependence on financial markets presents constraints and certain imperatives on what the government can do. I'm wondering what you see as the advantages disadvantages and possible constraints of the government's reliance on finance for these services? So, so the, the financial markets or the financial industry, so I get better clarity as to your question. So we're heavily reliant on... So having pension funds, for example, be reliant on returns from investments via financial markets, having the services and the state benefit dependent upon from how, what returns Okay, so over the years, right, once you had statutory changes, uh, CalPERS has become more diver diversified in its investments, right? You had legislation in the 1960s that uh, changed what the, the asset allocation could be. Uh, and part of this, and you can speak to the professionals like Paul here who are, do this for professional, right? Your, your number one investment decision is your asset allocation, right? What, what bucket are you putting your money in? Part of what they did instead of the reliance in the past on fixed income, more people know it as bonds, was that you could reduce the burden on taxpayers if you had other asset categories that performed, performed higher. The world has changed dramatically, as, as we know. 
So the bogey that you, we used to have could be easily attainable, right? When you think about back in the 1970s when inflation was double digits, right? When you could get double digits on bonds and you're, you, know, you just had to make back then 8%, right? And your most conservative portion of your portfolio is making in excess of that, it's easier. Today's market, low income, low return, low growth, right? Low inflation, it is a very, very difficult market. Uh, and so, and part of this is the world has changed, right? Early in the 1950s, after World War II, America's growing gangbusters. Others are trying to pay down their debt. America has that opportunity, builds world-class infrastructure that we're still living on today. Uh, so we have to make the appropriate adjustments uh, to do so. Right? But you know, it's not just you know, stocks and bonds. We're in real estate, well, alternative investments. The, so we're exploring all. But when you're at the scale of CalPERS, uh, 290 billion, if you're looking at CalSTRS, 185 to 190, uh, right, we, we operate at a different scale. So even though we could get into some, oftentimes uh, it has to be of great enough nature so that we can devote our limited resources to doing it properly. So there's, there's the good and the bad, uh, the opportunities and the challenges of being number one and number two. Could I ask you one question which we, we didn't um, have a chance uh, to, to delve into. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, where our state is going in terms of um, race relationships and, and racial and ethnic uh, harmony and police community relations. And I'm wondering what, uh, what you think that the state government and state leadership can do to try to, um, to, to bring communities uh, together more, create more um, more trust and less, uh, less conflict. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's all of us. Right? So it's more, government can fashion policies that bring people together. I mentioned the, the ch early childhood education, right? Part of that French model with early childhood education is uh, teaching kids not only cognitive functions, but social, emotional, psychological considerations. How do you get along with each other? Right, and local leadership and others need to bring people together, how you have the programs, how we speak together. Right, Hillary, Hillary used the term, and I'm not trying to be political, right, the implicit bias. Right? Implicit bias is real because of our, our life, ex, our, our, life uh, our, our everyday life examples. But I think most people are good-willed and they're good-hearted. They want good things. So again, I'll just, uh, if this is the last question, right, the yeah. comment. We grew up, our family was discriminated against. My mom, uh, who's English, she didn't have a great command. Uh, early, early on, uh, it was hard and it was painful. But my mom's devoutly Catholic. She goes nearly every day. She prays for all of us in the morning. Uh, and over a period of time, the people that were mean, the people that were uh, indifferent, they actually started like my mom. Right, she worked, she sell donuts like on Sunday. They just saw that she just wanted to be like everybody else. Her dreams for her kids were the same dreams as other moms. Right, and so she would reach out and some people were really good about reaching back. Uh, so over a period of time, as, as I tell people, uh, you have extraordinary power with every mo mm. breath of life you have. Right, you may feel really bad right now, but if you smile and say hi to somebody else, you don't know what you did to somebody else. Right, they may be not nice, but maybe somebody needed a little acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Somebody needed to be you know, supported. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we start that, we're all humans. We're all in this, in this country. We're all Americans. Uh, we, we can change it. And you have to, you have to, right, we have to appeal to our own better sides. Mm -hmm. right? It's easy to do what we're, we're witnessing today and give up and just say, you know, I'm not going to be my best, or I'm, gonna look, I'm not going to look at the best at others. Uh, we have to change our own thinking. Treasurer Chung, thank you so thank much you. for your leadership, and thank you for being here today. Thank you.